Ring, ring with Renny Revis. Hello and welcome to the show. We've got someone very special with us today. Someone you may or may not know. But don't worry, we'll explain all the inside jokes. Just sit back and enjoy the voyeurism, folks. It's Ring Ring with Renny Revis. Hey, thanks for joining me. Welcome to the first episode. Thanks for dialing M for Maybe I'll Listen to This Thing. Our first guest is my pal Brandon Johnson. Brandon is an actor and comedian, possibly best known for playing Mr. Goldenfold on Rick and Morty. His most recent work includes voice and on-camera roles in Close Enough, American Dad, and A Black Lady Sketch Show. I first became aware of Brandon after seeing him do characters on stage in comedy shows, one of which was the 1988 Nakatomi Corporation Christmas Party, which, as you might guess, was interrupted by Hans Gruber because this show was based on Die Hard. It was so funny because throughout the show, Brandon would occasionally pop up as McLean's limo driver, and he was wearing a suit and had a big phone. Hilarious. What's the 411? Here's some info that'll help eavesdroppers better understand our conversation. In improvisation, players have to edit scenes. This can be done with another actor running across the stage. In the call, I refer to this as wiping. Jet Magazine is an African-American news publication first printed in 1951 that chronicled the civil rights movement. A coyote is a term used for a smuggler who's paid to transport migrants illegally into the U.S. Okay, uh, so this is a great time to mention that if anybody asks, this is most certainly a fictional podcast in which I tell lies! On TV and film sets, catering is called crafty. Sometimes on sets, background actors who are not in the sag after union literally get worse accommodations than union performers, including food options. An AD is an assistant director. Porto's is a Cuban bakery and restaurant with great sandwiches. Okay, Brandon didn't ask me to bleep out the studio names, but we both agreed it was funnier. I don't make it clear that I didn't actually slam this woman's face on my windshield who was shoving pamphlets in my hands. I really just screamed at her and pushed my hands out to make her get away from me, but I coulda! In the HBO series A Black Lady Sketch Show, there's a running sketch in which a group of friends are quarantined together following a global disaster that predated the 2020 pandemic. Hi, Brandon. Good morning. Did you get up early? Are you an early guy? I used to be an insomniac, but now I'm an early guy all of a sudden. Okay. Well, give me some pointers because I'm kind of new to this insomniac thing, but I'm in it pretty deep. Beautiful pauses. Beautiful pauses was my um, (laughs) all Catholic male rap group in the late (laughs) 80s. Is it because they couldn't think of any rhymes? Why'd they pause? We really wanted to give the uh, DJ and the producers uh, an ability to showcase their own music. So we would rap and then stop for about 45 seconds just so the listener could hear how great the music was. (laughs) Have some time for a prayer real quick. Yeah. After that, I was in a traveling cover comedians group. So we did different comedians act all over so there was um we had a young kid who did a a great anthony jeselnik uh i did a very late in his career eddie murphy this is sort of a um it's sort of a contextual piece it's high concept i do a 90 year old eddie murphy talking to a much younger sinbad oh man i want to get out of this improv scene i can't think of an opener for this (laughs) You ain't got no ice cream. In my day, we, we had licked ice cubes. That's all we had. I don't know. I'm backing out of this scene. I'm wiping. <laughs> Did you go to church and such? My grandfather and my great-grandfather were ministers. Oh, yeah. One, one was better than the other. My great-grandfather, Lemon Johnson. <laughs> was amazing. He was on the cover of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch when he died, but he was black. So that's Mm -hmm. crazy because usually if you get on the cover of a newspaper in the 1900s and you're black and it's the Uh South, you, yeah, if you're dead, it's not that they're celebrating you. It's that they found you. 
if the first word is found, I know. Mm, and it's not Jet Magazine. I really like that you know Jet Magazine. That's all I know. I mean, if you want to quiz, quiz me on, on 60s publications, civil rights and black Americana, uh, like if I had a multiple choice question, I might get it right. But I'm super impressed. Um, so that meant that I had to go to church yeah. from about six o'clock in the morning until three in the afternoon. And then my mother was going to be a nun. So we were crazy Catholic on one side of our family. Whoa. So you got and it double. The, I got it triple. triple because I grew up in a super Jewish community. Mm-hmm. Did you grow up uh, religious? I went to, let's see, I went to Lutheran schools and what's the other one? There's so many Christian. <laughs> what's the Christian where you can't wear nail polish and do your hair like a boy? <laughs> That's Lutheran. Oh, uh, Presbyterian. That's the nice one. Yeah, I think Lutheran is the harsher one. So um, I grew up in the Valley and my considerate immigrant parents thought the best thing to do is private school and the private schools in the area are religious. So they were religious on holidays. Right. We didn't practice anything. We didn't pray together. But I went to religious school up until 10th grade when my parents divorced and my mom <laughs> let me do whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing I want to do is pit you two against each other for more gifts. Hey, my car was a divorce gift. That's so much better than a push present. Did you say push present? I did. Oh, what's that? That's a, a present that a man gives to his uh, significant other when they have a baby. Oh, it's not an apology. Technically, it is. Now, I think I don't think you have to be a man to give it. I don't want you to be just the neighbor. You shouldn't be the neighbor. <laughs> You do need to be a woman giving a woman a push present if you guys are in a relationship or you uh-huh. just or you just drink a lot together. I don't think but, a lot of cars come out of the drinking a lot scenario. <laughs> oh, you know what? Opposite. Probably a quick decision if there was a lot of drinking involved. <laughs> Like, you didn't look at the Blue Book value. You didn't look at the Consumer Reports. Like, what did you get? I got a Toyota, and I still drive it. Oh! Blessed be. That is dope. It is dope. So you you grew up with two pastors. My um, great-grandfather was a pastor of a big, big church. I can't think of the name of it, but his name was Lemon Johnson. And then my grandfather was a pastor who sort of went from church to church. He never got his own church. He was a rolling stone. He was. <laughs> that was the problem, too. I'm going to tell you, that's probably why <laughs> this shit went down that way, because um, I got a lot of cousins. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever played with someone, and then while you are playing with them, you go through their family album, and you notice people that you know? <laughs> And my last name is Johnson. So that means yeah. that motherfucker thought that he was going to get away with it because there are so many Johnsons. So when somebody <laughs> brought him when somebody brought him a baby and said, the last name is Johnson, is it yours? He was like, no, you know how many Johnsons there are? <laughs> Idiot. Brandon, I do relate to finding out you had more family members accidentally or... <laughs> Or suddenly, wow. um, a little complicated. Let's go. Um, okay, so it's verified that my father had two children before me from different people. Um, and according to him, he made about five that didn't make it out the oven. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, we call that a baker's delight. <laughs> you throw out the first pancake, Brandon. That's right. That's right. That would work so much better if you baked pancakes, but I'm <laughs> I'm sticking with the joke. <laughs> Good. Um, so the first time I sang a solo in church was everything was church, so all of the performances were religious. I sang a solo, and my mother begged my dad to come, and he said, no, no, no. He didn't come because he was expecting to pick up a cousin of mine from a coyote from Mexico. <laughs> Whoa. So Whoa. I was I was like 13 and sad because I was just realizing that's not a priority for him, something that's important to me. And the next day, Brandon, there was a cousin of mine I had never met living in our apartment. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> Whoa, okay, so do you speak Spanish? Más o menos, comprendo más que hablo. Necesito mucho practicar. Pero at the time, 
No, I didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> Whoa. I love that you got a free, unrehearsed, undisclosed exchange student. Oh, yeah. And just like exchange students, he was so polite and so grateful to be there and made you feel like the most unappreciative American boiled brat. You know, he was sleeping on the couch and thought that our little snacks were the most bountiful treat from heaven. Just yeah. so grateful. And one day we were silently having breakfast because I don't speak Spanish. And, you know, of all the things to bring up, today is my birthday. <laughs> and no one else knew. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. 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 Here's your little Debbie snack cake. Happy birthday. <laughs> Holy shit. That is crazy. Where is he now? Mm, I don't know the answer to that right now. Okay. I, I assume he's here somewhere, and hopefully his papers are in order now. What a time to be anxious about that. I hope he's okay. Next time I have to talk to my dad, I'll ask him. Tim Buck says he's working in a birthday cake shop. <laughs> Puta madre, I'm going to make my own birthday cake. <laughs> That'd be like if a dude got out of prison and you came up to him and you were like, what do you miss the most? And he was like, frosting. Frosting. <laughs> he breaks a pinata, but frosting comes out. Yeah. Sprinkles are a trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no, 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 no sprinkles. Daryl, Daryl's coming to this party. You No, not not this time. I know it's festive, but mm, you don't know what he went through. <laughs> so um, what? <laughs> how many family members did you discover that shared that Johnson name and bloodline? Well, there's uncles in there that then also <laughs> did the same thing. So I want to say that there are five states of Johnson, and I'm pretty sure I'm responsible for one. Oh. They were prolific because you got a guy who is able to, you know, here's the thing. It's a numbers game. So you have a guy who can go from church to church to church, travel throughout the South as a pastor, as a minister, and preach. So anything can happen. I bet he said that to a lot of women. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord I don't know. You might need. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't know. You the might Lord need Jesus. Oh. Yeah. oh, you go. You go. Do you know what it is? It's that we both have the same timing. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm a Johnson. <laughs> so far, it seems like it. <laughs> hey, do you have this birthmark on your back? A little familiar. It just says Johnson. <laughs> Why is it in comic sense? <laughs> oh, Lord. I knew this about you, that you grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. Because of your answer when I asked you who your favorite comedian was. I said Joan Rivers. Wow, you didn't. Um, I said, wait, I said Don Rickles. You did. Yes! Rickles. Yes. I wonder if your comedy skews in that direction from your influences. Did you have any friends of the family who were funny Jewish people? I mean, you know, my best friends were Jewish. I went over to the side of the classroom that I heard the most laughter coming from. And thank God I was funny and I was able to fit in. And I think some people in high school really want to fit in with the good looking people or they really want to get varsity. But for me, I just wanted to find the funniest people to talk shit with on the playground. <laughs> Comedy is survival when you're a kid. It is. But there's also this thing about finding your tribe and like mm. settling in so that you can do other great things like I knew early on that I liked jokes. So when I found other people who liked jokes, and I'm talking like about eight years old, I kind of knew what was going on. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in my neighborhood, like the funniest kids were Jewish kids. Mm -hmm. It's insane. So funny. I love it. What were your favorite shows when you were eight? You said you found your comedic sensibility around that time. Well, no. You know, I was telling jokes before I was eight. And on TV, I really didn't watch sitcoms because it was like watching somebody else make the dough. You know, I really had this idea that comedy was a poor man Shakespeare and that you, you do it in the streets like you shoot craps. I came to it sort of like, hey, you fucking guy, you jerk. <laughs> you know, I wasn't like, comedy is a thing. I was like, no, you, you know, you, you speak this way because this is how we all speak. We speak this lingo. 
all my friends told jokes, my family told jokes. I did not know that there was really um, a job of comedy or like uh, mm-hmm. that, it was, that it was a thing that people got paid at and it was legit. And then, yeah. and then even when I did discover comedy, like on a stage, it came from people who were doing really dramatic work. So like the first thing that I ever saw was Whoopi Goldberg oh, um, yeah. around the world in 88 days. And that's a Broadway piece. <laughs> yes. So many characters. Right. Yeah. Honestly, Whoopi Goldberg is part of uh, my discovery that comedy was something adults did seriously, too, because of comic relief. Her and Billy Crystal and Robin Williams did the comic relief shows. So I vividly remember watching and being so surprised that grown ups could be so silly wow those are grown ass people and that's funny that you mentioned those three because Mm -hmm. to me those are comedians that had the ability to be actors at will you know robin williams started off as an actor and just Mm -hmm. played a super frenetic character most of his i think career that we all considered stand-up but i think he was like andy kaufman where he was offering us something super funny and we had to cage it in stand up or cage it in being funny and, and not really being a piece of work. So for yeah. me, I even though I came in to be funny, I didn't think of funny as that important to like how you get down. I was just like, everybody's <laughs> funny. Everybody's funny, so why should I try to go get a job being funny, you know? <laughs> Got it. I'm thinking of trying to package Robin Williams. Like, just such a force of creative energy and comedy. Like, we need to make you palatable. Right. Um, <laughs> you're going to be this guy now. Yeah, because if you look at his whole career, you go, wow, it's hard to contain that much energy. It's hard to contain yeah. that much force. He had to be Mork in some respects because you weren't going to make him a doctor on an NBC series, you know. It would have been the same character. <laughs> right. I like when comedians are finally able to have some gravitas. I like that Jim Carrey got the mm. second part of his career. I want that across the board for a lot of people. Like, it's rare that you get to see, I think, female comedians get to age and start to play these incredible, deep, deep roles. But I think that's because they didn't come to comedians necessarily for um, depth initially. Yeah. And what I want the future to be is like Kevin Pollock's of the world where some people think Kevin Pollack is an actor, you know, but like that dude was a stand up, you know, Oh yeah. for a really long time. I hope there's a way that we can get more props for being deep because I think comedians are some of the most spiritual people out there. Mm. Vulnerability is a requirement for truthful comedy. Yes. I think it's a great jumping off point is like, let's really risk if we're going to risk. Yeah. I think putting yourself out there, making people laugh, it's like, Emotional nudity. Yeah, it really is. Emotional nudity was also the name of my fourth <laughs> album. <laughs> Life in the key of nudity. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, I want to see your album cover. <laughs> So you're wearing anything in that album picture. No, uh, there's about 30 of us. We're all <laughs> naked. Some of us are holding young animals. Some of us are holding food. We don't want people to get confused. We are not eating the animals. We are eating the food. Is you the know- title track to the second album by the same group? We're not eating the animals. We're eating the food. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good song. <laughs> You know, there was somebody in that picture who was really mad they got stuck with the gerbil or whatever small animal it is. Hilarious. <laughs> Fucking Phil. <laughs> Phil is so angry right now. Why? Oh. How could you tell? Because he lost his boner? No, man. Because he smashed Crafty. He just flipped the whole Crafty table over. He's pissed that he's holding the gerbil. <laughs> Why does Brandon get the lion cub and I've got the <laughs> gerbil? <laughs> hey, man, because I have the van, all right? <laughs> I've got the van. Oh. <laughs> That's what every bass player says to keep himself in the group. Well, he is an asset, so give him the bear cub. It's true. <laughs> uh, are you getting a chance to hit that truth in comedy? Have you done any dramatic parts? You know, not really. Not really. Yeah. I did a movie called Flight. Where I you were played, in flight? I was in, no, not flight. I wish I was in flight. Actually, you know what? Edit it out. Just tell people I was in flight. You were in the back of the plane. 
we couldn't see you. <laughs> That's the greatest, greatest scam ever, is to tell people you were in these movies and be like, but crowd scenes. So mostly what I do is still in crowd scenes. So I'm what you call a sub extra. I'm not quite an extra, but if there are large crowd scenes, they always call me because I have this ability to really fill out a crowd while disappearing at the same time. He's the Philip Seymour Hoffman of extras. <laughs> I always got so petty when I would do extra work and see that people were telling their family from their hometown that they were in a movie. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Do you want to call those people back and say, listen, I'm here and... <laughs> we have, we've done two crosses. We've done two crosses. He got yelled yeah. at by the first AD <laughs> for stealing Welch's fruit snacks. So, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's in a movie, but he's also in trouble. Yeah, those Welch's snacks were on the union table, and he got, he got grabby. <laughs> right. That is the worst. I got to say, I have been everything. Oh, segregation? We, yeah, that's pretty the, <laughs> on a set. <laughs> I have had the craziest craziest moments all over and i mean i've been like after i was working professionally i still had weird moments where like you'd go someplace and it would be a big studio or whatever and they still had weird things like that it's like when you go to your friend's house and right before you open the door you smell like hot yogurt and your friend looks over at you and is like, oh, P.S. Man, my mom is crazy. And you're like, what? No, not not not. Why not? Why right now? Why right now? Did you tell me that? And then you step in, <laughs> and there's like some crazy shit popping off. Those are the kinds of sets that I have been on. Where you like, you walk in, and that's what they say. They're like, so uh, here's the kitchen. There's some oranges, got some grapes. Uh, don't use that toaster on Tuesdays. The EPs get really <laughs> angry about it. Um, also, that refrigerator's not for you. The glass one with all the food in it. This is your refrigerator. It's this cube that's on the ground. And um, here you go. Here's the gift bag. And it's full of all the food that we should have given you in the first place. I have seen the craziest sets. I was on this set once for f and I'll shit on f all day. Listen, uh -huh. we all know Brandon Johnson is synonymous with never going to be on network. And that's fine. Oh. But let, <laughs> it is fine. That's fine. I can't get my voice to sound <laughs> enthusiastic <laughs> about being a magical slave. All right. So oh, not next on. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> mm -hmm. But this is my point, not to sound bitter, is yes. that I'm on this set for. <laughs> and they used the same eggs throughout the day. To the point, I had to look at one of my co-stars and say, hey, my dude, if I were you, I wouldn't eat the lunch eggs because those are the eggs from the breakfast burrito. My dude ate those, food poisoning, two days out. <laughs> I've been on sets that make you sick. I filmed in Bell Gardens for two oh. weeks for f and was like, bro, it's the ghetto. And I'm black, so mm -hmm. I can say it's the ghetto because it's the ghetto. <laughs> You don't even have to say get towed. <laughs> how are you going to put me, how is going to put me in this neighborhood to compromise my situation? Uh, what <laughs> elements of the ghetto did you have to encounter? Let me tell you that I had to shoot a scene with Jaleel White, who continuously looked into the parking lot, Urkel, yeah. Jaleel White, and said, I can't believe I brought that car down here. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, you could probably buy another one. And you nervous? Oh, right. It was pretty sketch. I'm sorry about that. No, I just, I just, only reason I bring it up is to say it's crazy how sometimes you are in a double wide trailer and somebody's like, Mr. Johnson. And then sometimes they're like, okay, so your lunch bag's right there. And now those are your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> are these my clothes? <laughs> are you borrowing what? this from someone? <laughs> Exactly. You made it sound like even if they were my clothes, I was going to have to leave them with wardrobe. Where the fuck are we right now? <laughs> Where's wardrobe? Uh, okay, so there's no wardrobe and there's no um, there's no trailer or holding for you. So if you just want to stand by me till the first gets here, who are you? <laughs> Do you work with us? <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Sharon's brother. Oh, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> where is Sharon? And who is Sharon? Sharon is the third AD. There's no such thing. Okay, where are we? And you know That's he smells saying. like hot yogurt. <laughs> 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 this situation uh, smells like hot yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> I have nowhere near the experience that you have, but I was on a film set that didn't have coffee that day. I know that sounds like a real diva problem to have, but not when I'm an addict, you know? I do. And it, when they don't have coffee, you think to yourself <laughs> all of the things that are also going to be fucked up. Because if I roll up on a movie set and there's no coffee, I oh. feel like it's probably an abduction or an intervention. <laughs> like, how sober is this set? I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, somebody is about to put me in a bag because this is a fake ass set. <laughs> if there's no coffee, there's no coffee and there's no red vines on this set. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's like if somebody was trying to trick people and they didn't know how to trick people. And they were like, yes, come to set. It will be fine. Everything will be fine. It is real set. And you get there and you see two cameras. You see a guy trying to put a live on you, but there's no <laughs> coffee and there's no Kirkland. There's not even a hint of a, a a shitty fast food wrapper. I love those days on set where they just give up and they're like, yeah, today y'all having Portos, man. <laughs> oh, I love Portos. Like, I love Portos, too. But I do love when they just come back with like, man, y'all like, um, who like Baja Fresh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or, or, hey, I got 15 fish fillets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. what? The worst. The worst until it's the best. <laughs> what I love is that on a big money set, if they're like, we have Paha Fresh, you're like, man, fuck that. <laughs> but on, on like an indie set, after you've been eating the worst shit for a week, and they're like, we have Baja Fresh. You're like, oh, my God, you didn't have to do that. How much is this costing you? Another limb? Is this why you have hair and makeup because you, you got Baja Fresh today? <laughs> I was on a set and they said, you know, here's how it goes. You guys can have trailers for the week or we can stop shooting two days early. <laughs> I'll be in my car anyway. So I'm going to be in my car. You can take my trailer. Take my trailer, please. I need this money. I need SAG health credit. So yeah, man, we need to shoot. Go ahead and get rid of those trailers. Take them. Go ahead. What am I going to say? Yeah. Diff me on my job. Right. Please. I, I didn't camp as a child, guys. I didn't camp. So, like, having a room away from my house is, like, super important to me right now. So, I'm going to vote for trailers. <laughs> Camping is my worst nightmare. Um, put me in a place with no shower, no comfy bed. Um, right. Mosquitoes love me. My blood type is mosquito-friendly. <laughs> Camping is the stairs of life. <laughs> Yeah, there's some people who wake up early and they, they're rocky, you know. They right. they do their reps on the stairs. They're ready to go. And then there's the rest of us who will avoid places that have right. stairs. <laughs> right. Who see an escalator or an elevator and go, that is brilliant. <laughs> Somebody said once, if you stop using the escalators and the elevators, they'll rip them out and they'll put in stairs. Because uh-huh. those, those two things are, I think it's Carlin who said it, because those two things are very expensive. And I firmly, firmly feel that way about camping. I'm like, if they get used <laughs> to you sleeping in tents, in the wilderness with no running water, no soap, no amenities. They'll be like, these motherfuckers are stupid. They like being outside. Why are we charging so little for inside? So I refuse to camp. I also think that there are animals out there. <laughs> yeah, listen, I'm glad we're having this soapbox moment. <laughs> Down also... with camp. No, not, not the children in cages. Oh, well, that too. But <laughs> the camps. Close the camps. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. I know. I'm a 2020 type of person. I know which thing to stand on. Not the kids in the camps. The kids going camping. You know why? Because I cannot make a sign for the other thing. But I can make a sign that has a tent with an arrow pointing down next to it. So that it looks like I'm saying I'm a tent. But I'm not saying I'm a tent. 
I'm saying down with camping. The causes that are closest to me are directly in line with how well I draw. Right. <laughs> Brandon, I can't draw that tinfoil reflective blanket on these migrant children. I just can't get it right. <laughs> the little fence around them. It's a lot of lines. <laughs> yeah, I can't draw dogs, but I can draw unicorns. So we got to stop <laughs> killing these unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean is dogs. Okay, so this is a little unicorn because I'm against puppy mills. We got to stop having these puppy mills. <laughs> Why is this a balloon floating over a river, Brandon? Because immigration is serious. So I'm for strong immigration policy, and that's the balloon floating to safety. <laughs> Can you explain the one that's just an X? <laughs> right. That was a, I gave up on that one, that cause. <laughs> I was going to a Planned Parenthood rally, and I was like, we got to save Title IX. So I drew the X too big. <laughs> drew the X too big. <laughs> and now I can't put oh. the L next to the I next to it. So it's just <laughs> save Title X. <10." laughs> oh because you know they probably have one. You know they got a Title Nine, so you know they're probably coming up with the Title oh. Ten. So I'm like, we got to save Title Nine and Ten, well, because I could not draw a Nine. Republicans are evil. I'm just anticipating. You've got it ready. <laughs> right. I I can be driven to extreme anger, but I have to be pushed real, real hard. And the one time in my life where I was angry enough to pull a woman by her hair and smash her head on my windshield. <laughs> was at a Planned Parenthood. Wow. Um, I have gone to Planned Parenthood for a lot of different reasons. I've never had an abortion. If I had one, I would just tell you. I mean, it's, but in my case, I've gone for all kinds of stuff, testing, Good. infections, whatever. So I had a UTI. I had some PP pain. I have a Planned Parenthood really close to me, but I never go to that one. Uh, you know, I never really wanted to go to that location, but the P don't lie. Like, <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> I went to the Van Nuys Planned Parenthood, got my antibiotic, and I got out, and this woman was right up in my face. Can I just talk to you for a second? Can I just talk to you for a minute? I just want to talk to you. Just want to talk to you. I have information I want to share with you. I have information I want to talk to you. Um, she started speaking Spanish at first, and then I said something in English, and then she said it in English. Ah, oh, shit. Uh, okay. they real slippery. Oh, so slippery. And I'm getting in my car, and she shoves pamphlets in my hand, pro-life pamphlets. Okay, let me separate this from the pro-life issue and just focus on the invasion of privacy. Right. <laughs> just that. I'm getting in my car. I'm opening the door in my private place. Because I don't have a trailer. Where am I going to go? <laughs> oh, my God. You're a craftswoman. She puts the pamphlets in my hands while I'm opening my door. <laughs> no. No. Like, it could have been anything. I almost pulled her ponytail. I'm a monster. I know now. No. I know no, now. you're not. You're great. Because I will tell you that it's okay to disagree at mm. the point that you can get... <laughs> You know, yeah, it is, though. I mean, people have the right okay. to have their feelings, right? Yes. Once you enforce your feelings, that's an issue. Mm. Oh, that's yeah. what sexism is and racism is. It's, I don't care if you're racist. I don't want you to put in place policies. I don't care if, if you don't like women or you don't like gay people. I don't want mm. you to enforce policies against them. You can think yeah, whatever you, you, you can't want. You can't feelings. I have always resented people that showed up at locations that Planned Parenthood has paid rent on. That's always my issue is mm -hmm. I don't like when you come to Planned Parenthood to harass us. You yeah. can say what you want to say, but at the end of the day, I didn't build a location so that you could come by and talk shit. Mm -hmm. It's the craziest thing. You know, stand-ups, we have these things, as you know, where it's a setup. So I got to set this whole joke up. And sometimes if you're standing up next to another stand-up, they'll hit your punchline a beat faster than you. And sometimes you have to look over and say, hey, bro, <laughs> I wasn't doing all that work so that you could come in and kill. And that's the same fucking way I feel about people who stop by abortion clinics. Go do They're it unwelcome. on your turf. Don't show up over here so that you can cause us problems because that's not yeah. what we do. Planned Parenthood doesn't show up at churches that disagree with their policy and try and convert mm. people. And – she was anti-abortion. The truth of the matter yeah. is, is Planned Parenthood 
publicly they say 3% of Planned Parenthoods do abortion. The number mm-hmm. privately has been disputed. Oh. Some people say it's a sure. little bit higher than 3%. I, but even if I it's it shit, it could be 100% and it would still be right. My point, yeah. though, is <laughs> the locations that actually do abortions, it's so small. It's such a small number of them that you don't need to go to each Planned Parenthood. Well, like they're not, even, they're not even smart enough or calculated <laughs> enough to understand – that the places that they're going aren't even places that perform abortions, and you don't mm-hmm. just run around trying to harass people into your way of thinking. But if you do, at least get the address right. Have some education in your hate. Some exactly. Hate. I would respect you more if you actually had some talking points. If you could explain to me why someone should not be allowed to do something, or if you could show mm-hmm. policy in the same vein when it comes to um, men. Like Kamala Harris asked the greatest question of Brett Kavanaugh, which was, can you please tell me the government policy over Mm. men's bodies? I remember that distinctly because it gave me a look over my shoulder moment like, oh, man, yes. Right. And if that is the case, then people need to stand down and they need to understand before you look at something and say you're against it, you need other examples of when you were against something similar. Because if you can't find that, then what you're being is racist or sexist or homophobic. If you don't like it when someone else does it, but you don't care if this person has it done to them, then something's wrong Mm. with your thinking. You know, so I I don't feel like you were wrong for showing her what it looks like when somebody comes to your house (laughs) and invades your space. Because that's what she was doing to you. Maybe she didn't know it was going to go that far. But you kind of have to assume that if you trample on somebody's right, they're going to pull on your leg and find their way back up. Yeah. This was like grabbing a cat and pushing them into the bathtub. Like, yeah. In terms of my visceral response. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's funny what sets us off. Yeah. Great points. So you got to be excited about Kamala. I'm overjoyed. Are. The only thing that will make me happier is when Biden steps down within a year and two months because he feels like he's got to spend more time with his family. And then I can be like, gotcha, racist. We tricked you good. Yeah. Just like you thought we were going to do. And now there's a black woman president. <laughs> Oopsies. You- <laughs> Biden might lock himself in the basement again. So we can Fine. count on that too. Fine. You know, I appreciate Biden. I'm not going to say, oh, I love Joe Biden or Joe Biden was my first choice. My first choice Mm -hmm. was none of the men running this year. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. I liked Klobuchar. I liked Harris. There were days when I liked Warren. Um, But to me, that is where the party sort of needs to go. You know, it it feels like that's where we were headed anyway. So I'm super excited about Kamala. I really, really am. I'm glad. I love what you said about Biden meeting Kamala because he needs a black woman to stop him from saying stupid shit. (laughs) It's true. It's very, very true. I got to say, whenever something goes down in the United States that is hard for the United States to deal with, Mm-hmm. They go and they get a black choir. Like at the end of 9-11, all those telethons, there's always a black choir. At the end of any great suffering in the United States, there was cue the black choir to say that it's over wow. or to say that it's really serious or this person is very beloved. If Bill Clinton died tomorrow, there would be a huge funeral. But at the end of the funeral, there'd be a black choir, even though he's a white man and didn't go to a black church. So what we have done in the United States has forced black women to be the black choir and to clean up the messes of the past 80 years. So right now, I feel like smart money is like even we know as Mm -hmm. racist and as sexist as we are, there are some things that black women do politically that we can benefit from. Yeah, and they vote in big numbers. The voting, the community Mm -hmm. activism is really solid. And I think the United States at this point really does need to lean on the backs of the people that it oppresses the most. Because if we have survived this long through so Mm. much turmoil and had to survive even when things were good for white people but bad for black people, then at the point where the whole nation is falling apart, Mm. you might want to turn to the people who have held their internal nation together amidst great struggle. Mm. Yes, and have relied on leaders that don't represent them to move in the right direction. Just generations of having to vote for white men in leadership roles 
yeah. So generations of people voting for their best interests by electing leaders that don't represent them, that they don't necessarily agree with. It's a step-by-step process, and we're getting a little closer. That's that's the voice of unheard, of formerly unheard. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know where I'm I just, going there. No, you nailed it. It's that one of the things that I think is important is that people who have been victims of policy from government and people who have been mm. left out of making policies that might affect their own communities yes. really, really understand what law is and what governance is. So if you are a mother in Watts and you've been trying to get your kids into different schools and you notice that schools are getting poorer and poorer and poorer, but you see charter schools or magnet schools where parents are able to come into a poor neighborhood, throw money at a school, fix it up, uh. get better teachers – then you you know what school bond H is. You know what school bond B or Z or whatever is because you're hoping mm-hmm. and praying that your kids can get some of that money that's coming from the city on that vote. That's, yeah. that's why I feel like minorities tend to know the law and tend to know what change mm. needs to occur better than politicians, better than um, middle class and upper middle class families in America. That's how you got the divide, where people were sort of like making policy that didn't reach the multiple people who needed it because they had never been in those situations. Yeah, making policies for groups that they don't connect with, represent, not listening to the voices of the communities that they're enacting policy for. Right, right. It's incredible how much the wrong aid gets sent to the wrong people. It's Mm. almost like dropping rakes to people who are thirsty in the desert and saying, this will give you the ability to grow crops. And once you've grown crops, rain will come. <laughs> you know, it's not really how it works. You need to get those people water and then speak to them about what they feel like they could grow in the desert. We sort of got away from that. But the people that we're sending to Washington are the people who really feel like this is the only way for them to mm. get their people what they need. And it's time to let those people lead, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to quote Hamilton and get, get in the room where it happens. You have yeah. to, you have to people please in spaces where people disagree with you because they have the power to enact policy. Right. So you have to get in there. And yeah. I'm happy to see that happen. Me too. And I love Maya Rudolph. <laughs> We're going to get some work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's a powerhouse. I love seeing her do anything really. Her mother was Minnie Ripperton. Is that true? Yes. Yes. And her uh, father was a very famous reindeer who, um, if there's any dads out there. <laughs> Did he become a pastor? <laughs> oh, I think it's time for my Baja Fresh. Right? Yay! <laughs> hey, you got Baja Fresh. Love Baja Fresh. <laughs> so I got the shrimp and chicken. Group shrimp. <laughs> 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 Thanks for chatting. It's nice to catch up with you, Brandon. I love seeing you and stuff. Yeah, me too. I love seeing something and go, ah, it's Brandon. (laughs) And that will be my ringtone. (laughs) Ah, Brandon. (laughs) Yeah, the last thing I saw you in was uh, a Black Lady Sketch Show. The Emmy-nominated Black Lady Sketch Show. There you go. Shout out to that room. They're amazing. I'm so, so psyched have been on that show that that room and those people mm-hmm. are amazing amazing good and they got picked up again i'm glad you had a good experience yeah i actually did the second table read we were about to go into production mm-hmm. yeah for second season and it is hilarious as usual they deserve the emmy nomination awesome. and i'm so psyched and then uh of course we all had to shut down yeah they predicted it though like every it's episode true. had a storyline <laughs> it's true it was psychic. see black women are psychic Listen, listen to black women. <laughs> if I can support anything today, it is to listen to black women for sure. Yeah, I know a couple <laughs> cool ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brandon, you stay cool. I think you it's too. 100 today. I'll see you. Oh, shit. We got this. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. Bye, Brandon. Take care. Today's episode was brought to you by Emotional Nudity, the city of Bell Gardens, and of course, Baja Fresh. Please stay on the line for our next episode with Rachel Great.